So when we left off uh, augmenting the CPU to make it much faster uh, using things like pipelines and multiple execution units, we noted a couple of times that the thing that would probably most inhibit us was the ability to actually feed the CPU so that it could use all of these great organizational pieces that we uh, put in place uh, to enable those speeds. One thing that we discussed was that we were going to change over from a basic program counter where we had this idea that we were going to retrieve one instruction at a time so that we could decode and execute it to instead retrieving a whole batch of instructions at a time, maybe a hundred or more. Uh, and then we were actually going to point with an instruction pointer uh, to the current instruction that we were working with. The advantage here was that we knew memory access would take a long time, and if we had to wait on retrieving each instruction before we could actually act upon it, we would slow our CPU down by an order of magnitude or more. What we're going to explore here are the memory, uh, and actually partly bus, uh, components that we need to put in place to enable that action to happen. Uh, there's going to be, on the memory side, really two things we're going to explore. Wide path memory access and memory interleaving. Uh, the second part of this, cache memory, is going to be its own topic and we'll cover that separately. Wide path memory access is this idea that instead of just retrieving information from memory one byte or word at a time, remember that a word is uh, typically goes along with the size of the actual uh, architecture. Um, so if you have a 32-bit machine, then you would have a 32-bit word size or a 4-byte word size. Uh, if you had a 64-bit uh, machine, you would have a 64-bit word size. Um, now, systems will commonly retrieve information in a word size. Uh, 6502, uh, which I've referenced a few times throughout the semester, uh, was actually an 8-bit machine, so it actually had an 8-bit word size. Commonly, when we describe these technologies, we like to talk about it in uh, one-byte words just because of the simplicity of doing so, but please keep in mind that a modern uh, CPU does, in fact, uh, usually work in larger sizes. All that said, all we're really uh, getting to here is that Instead of having just uh, one word size or one byte even between the CPU and memory and having to bring things back and forth one byte at a time, why not just widen the road, so to speak? Uh, I'm sure uh, most of you have driven either in New Jersey or California at some point or maybe seen pictures of it, uh, but you know, it is not uncommon for highways there to have, you know, six or seven lanes in each direction, depending on, uh, you know, where you are, if you're in like Orange County or if you're on uh, the Garden State or something. But uh, the idea here is that a wider road can, you know, have more throughput. It can get more cars uh, to go down it. So why can't we do the same for our memory bus? And the reason, you know, the, the actual answer is there's no reason why we can't. We can absolutely get out of memory more than one thing at a time uh, and basically just make sure that we have a wide enough data bus to do so. Now, uh, doing this makes the data bus much larger because we need more lines to accommodate bringing information. And most importantly, it also means that we have to have a much wider memory data register because our memory data register, remember, is going to hold on to the results of what we retrieve from memory uh, so that the CPU can have access to them. So while our memory address register needs to be the correct size to address all of the memory that we want to access, our memory data register needs to be the correct size to retrieve uh, however much data that we're going to pull out of memory at one time. How do we know what information to pull out of memory? Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in memory interleaving, but for right now, 
uh, just realize that most of the time, at least, uh, if not all of the time, we're going to be retrieving blocks that are grouped together. So usually when you uh, retrieve information, this idea of locality of reference means that information around it is most likely related to what you're working with. So for example, if I pull out a instruction, uh, most likely the next four instructions are going to be useful to me, right? Uh, the same thing even applies to data. If I want one element of an array, for example, there's a good chance that the next four elements of that same array are also going to be useful. So the answer to what information we pull across at the same time is usually just the information that's right after what we were asking for. We'll talk more about the details of that, especially when we get to caching uh, with cache lines and stuff like that. But for right now, just imagine that it's information that, you know, is grouped together. So if instead of just retrieving the first byte or word, I retrieve the first four, say, and I bring them all across at once because I have a, a wider bus in order to do so. Memory interleaving now is something that we use in, um, you know, tandem with wide path memory access. What memory interleaving is, is this idea of instead of having uh, one kind of continuous memory, we're in fact going to divide memory up into equal parts. If you've ever looked at a chip of RAM, a DRAM module, you've probably noticed that there are, you know, usually I think eight uh, actual physical chips on there. What those eight physical chips are, are actually your eight uh, individual uh, RAM chips. So if you, say, have a stick of memory in your hand and it's an eight gigabyte RAM module uh, and it has eight chips on it, each of those chips is in fact uh, a one gigabyte memory module. Now, uh, the way we treat this uh, we think of it as, you know, the same memory, but in reality, it's actually eight different units of memory. Each of those eight have their own memory address register and their own memory data register. They're all independently accessible, and we call this n-way interleaving, where n-way is the number of chips that we're in fact using, or the number of ways that we're interleaving. Uh, I'll probably use 8 as the, the default because that's the most common way to break this down. Now, if we use this in conjunction with the wide path memory access, so say our wide path allowed for 8 uh, actual addresses to be accessed at once, and we have 8 chips, I think you kind of see where this is going. We can access all 8 chips at the same time, get 8 different things, send them down our bus that's capable of of taking eight cars, so to speak, at the same time. It has eight lanes, and now all of a sudden we're, we're kind of rolling, right? So this is the piece that allows us to access memory eight times at the same time, right? Because if memory was all one unit with one memory address register and one memory data register, even if we had a, a highway that had eight lanes, we could only get one thing in and out at a time because of uh, our, our bottleneck would actually be the memory address register and the memory data register. But if we have those eight separate chips, each with their own memory address and data register, and we have an eight lane highway, now we can do it all at the same time. So when we save information uh, like a word, what we're really doing is breaking that information up and saving it in each of those eight chips, one chunk of it in each of those eight chips. And then we access it the same way. We don't just access one in the first chip, we access the first of each of those chips all the way across the eight. So when we, uh, say, make a memory access, uh, an eight-way memory access would be at, say, addresses 0, 8, 16, 24, 32, etc. So it kind of stripes across the unit, uh, as would 1, 9, 17, 25, and 33. And then you would keep going up by 8 for each of those. You would keep increasing by 8 as you went from chip to chip. 
Here's a little bit of a, a graphic representation of what this would look like with just four chips to keep things a little simpler. So I have my memory address register and data register for each actual physical memory chip. Uh, this, If you look at any single one of these, uh, this is how we depicted it earlier in the class when we discussed uh, memory access as it worked with the CPU. So our memory address uh, for each one would be populated here. Uh, so here we're accessing for 0, 1, 2, and 3 would be the data that we would get back in each of these memory data registers. They would go uh, back on the, the larger bus uh, and be returned to us. When it's important to note that when we're accessing in this way, uh, in this case, we have four chips, so we're going to get four things back at any given time. So an access to memory 0 gives us 0, 1, 2, and 3. An access to memory 4 gives us 4, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, we can access these things individually if we want to. That's absolutely fine. We lose a little bit of the speed because we're not then pulling out of the other ones at the same time, just the one. Um, but we cannot write uh, to different ones at the same time. So it has to be in the same sequence. It can't be out of that sequence.